we're gonna cut this part of the is, is, should I <laughs> I'm not kidding. I like I honestly like I hadn't even really talked about my husband that much. And so I was just like, okay, yeah. great. Like that never goes over like, well. <laughs> she was like, all right, uh, good choice. I got a letter the other day from somebody, like a letter. Like somebody mailed me a letter. Like they took time to find my office address and mail me a letter which was about how basically like stop talking. Get out of like, here. Yeah. It was just like, there were some people, he was like, you know, you're not supposed to promote your stuff. There was a guy who was like. Hello and welcome back to Redirected. My name is Andrew East. And I think we can all agree that life is full of unexpected events. For better or for worse, things don't usually turn out how we think they will. And so I wanted to sit down with some people who have experienced some huge unexpected events and made it through to the other side in hopes that I could glean some wisdom for myself and share that with you because we all go through unexpected events. It's how we make it through those that determines what's next for us. And today I couldn't be more honored that Professor Emily Oster decided to join us. Dr. Oster got her PhD from Harvard and she's an economist who deals with health-related issues. She's written two books, including Expecting Better and Crib Sheet. In her first book called Expecting Better, Dr. Oster walks us through all the studies related to pregnancy and the decisions that a mom has to make. So can I drink coffee? Should I be on bed rest? Can I exercise? In hopes to give people a more informed way to make decisions. And then in Crib Sheet, she talks us through the early years of raising a child. So can I sleep with the child on my bed? Should I sleep train them, all these different issues, and there's a million different decisions. And so I really appreciate Dr. Oster's way of approaching this problem and all these different decisions with database studies. And whether you agree with her or not, Dr. Oster is very approachable and understanding. She's not overbearing with her recommendations. And so I'm really excited to share this interview with you guys where she walks us through how she got into this and then the different results and surprising things that she came across. I am so excited to be sharing this interview with you because it's so relevant in my life right now. One, because Sean and I are having a child in October, and for a lot of people, having a child is the biggest redirection or pivot moment in life. So without further ado, I'm going to jump into this episode with Dr. Oster. Can't wait to hear your feedback, and let's get going. Emily, do I call you doctor? Do I call you professor? What do you Emily, go by? Emily is great. Emily are you is sure? Great. Yeah, Emily okay. is great. And I just want to say uh, right off the bat that uh, I'm terrified to be a parent and I'm thankful to be talking to you because I think you got some, some tips for me and any other future parents out there. So I have some tips, although I'm sure you will be a great parent with or without tips. <laughs> <laughs> so this show is all about people who have had interesting career pivots. Everybody ultimately does in their career. We're going to get to that, but I want to hear about your upbringing. Apparently, you're like this, you're a legend. I'm not sure. Okay. So, um, <laughs> like that's quite, yeah. So, um, so my parents, uh, my parents were professors, um, and I grew up in Connecticut. Um, and I, I think the thing you are talking about is that when I was a, when I was a little kid, I used to talk to myself in my crib, which I actually want to say is like super common. Okay. Um, so a lot of kids talk to themselves. You may find, you may learn this when your kid is like two, a lot of kids talk to themselves before they go to sleep. Um, but most people's parents are pretty like regular, respectful people who just let them talk to themselves and then that's it. But my parents, <laughs> I, my parents put a tape recorder under my bed at the request of some researchers. And so then there's this like whole corpus of tapes of me like talking to myself and all the like different stuff that I would, I would say, which is mostly like super uninteresting. Um, but then some people had written a book about like how, kind of how kids language develops based on these things. So that was like, that's like a, a little piece of, of what my childhood was like. <laughs> well, so I don't know if you did the story justice. Apparently your speech was way more complex than what it would have been for other people your age, right? Like yeah, I, I talked early. I talked early. I talked a lot. Um, okay. I talked a lot and, and early, yeah. But, right. uh, but I, think, I think to be fair, like the whole book, the book, there's like this book written about this, but it, it, the book isn't like, isn't it amazing that this person talks so early? The book is like, just like, isn't it interesting that, you know, the, the knowledge of the future develops before knowledge of the past or whatever. It's like a book about like, huh. like language development and not at all about, it's like, I mean, it's, it's telling, I've never read the book, even though it is about me. Okay. I have never made it through the book. <laughs> So, uh, Interesting. Okay, go. good to there know. Go. Well, thank you for giving background on yeah, that. Yeah, there's the background. Um, so your parents were economists too, is that right? Yes, my parents were economists also, both of them. And my husband is an economist. So we've You're really got economist. it kind of coming out of the years. Yeah. How did, you, how did you get into what you're doing? 
So, you know, I, um, I kind of knew what being an economist was because that was my parents' job. And I think right. for, for a lot of people, it's like, it wouldn't, that's not like a job like doctor where you're like, oh, I, I know about that, you know, but I, I knew about it. Um, and then I was always super interested in, in kind of research and, and academics and, and trying to learn new facts about the world. And so when I was in college, I kind of bobbed around a little bit, but basically gravitated towards, um, doing, doing economics. And I don't know, it's like, I mean, this is, you're the one with the podcast about like how people get to where they're going. Like, yeah. I don't know, yada, yada, yada. Anyway, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay. Uh, so you got your PhD from Harvard. Yes. And then did you teach at the University of Chicago's business school? I did. Yeah. I was at the University of Chicago's business school for like, you know, eight years or something. And then I came to Brown. Wow. And were you doing similar work when you were in Chicago? Yeah. I mean, so my, my research is mostly about health. So I'm, I'm kind of interested in um, how people make health decisions and right. in particular the times that they make decisions that are not, we think would be like not the best decisions. Right. Um, and so, so that's, so I was, I've been working on that for, for a long time. I was doing that in Chicago. I was doing that. I do that here. So it's the same kind of thing. Wow. Very cool. So I uh, was listening to your TED Talk and it's titled, What Do We Really Know About the Spread of AIDS? And that was in 2007. Do I have that, that correct? That was, yeah. Um, can you talk to us about that, your, what your topic was, but also the experience of doing TED Talk? So my, my talk was about some research that I had done, actually a few different pieces of research about kind of what we, how we understand the HIV epidemic in Africa, which um, at the time, you know, this was sort of before there were a lot, it was a lot of access to treatment in Africa. And so um, the epidemic was more of a, it was more of a death sentence. Um, and so my research was, is basically about, was, was about kind of understanding why people would make, uh, would, would undergo, like would have sex without a condom, even sure. in the face of this, uh, this deadly disease. And just trying to think about that, um, trying to think about that behavior and, and trying to understand it through the lens of saying, you know, maybe it's because the other risks of, of death are really high. And so the kind of incentive to avoid this is, is lower. So sort of digging into some of the behavioral economics of that, uh, of that experience, um, or that, that kind of policy question, um, in terms of giving a, a Ted talk, I have to say like when now, I, so I actually know some people who have given Ted talks more recently now that Ted is like this huge thing. And they said like, you go and they make you practice and they like make you like do all this stuff and like make sure it's really good. And like all this stuff. <laughs> when I did it, it was just like, they were just like, okay, here's your headphones. Like you know, nobody even asked me, nobody <laughs> asked me what I was going to say. They're just like, good luck. You know, you have the, like the timer is up there. Like there was no, there was like, they, I told them the title and like, that was it. There was no curation of any sort. And what it meant was like the cop. So I went to this conference and of course the conference it was amazing. There were all kinds of like super interesting people, but like some of the talks were like awful. Really? Right. Like it, like some of the talks like were so bad that like the guy, Chris Anderson, would like got up on the stage and was like basically like stop talking. Get out of like, here. Like it yeah. was just like there were some people he was like, you know, you're not supposed to promote your stuff. There was a guy who was like promoting his stuff. And Chris Anderson was just like, You have to get off the stage now. So it was uh, just like a totally I think a totally different thing than it is than it is now. I don't know. It was like super interesting. Wow. Um, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So you wrote your first book about parenting, um, expecting better. Was that in 2014? When so the book out? came out in 2013, I think. Okay. Yeah. After you had been pregnant. Yes. My daughter, my older kid is born, was born in 2011. So I kind of sold the book when I was like 35 weeks pregnant and I wrote it kind of in the first year. Oh my gosh. So, so again, the show's kind of about interesting career pivots. And I feel like based off you know, what I came across in research that that might've been a pivotal moment for you. Yeah. Having put out your first book is huge, but also there is, there's so much honestly hate out there that, that was a result of that book. Um, can you tell us about the book itself and why you wanted to write it? What your big, just kind of do a, a summary of, of what Expecting Better is. Yeah. So, um, so I, you know, I, I got pregnant. So this, I guess it was like 2010. Um, and I, I sort of had this experience that I think kind of a lot of women have, which is that this is, this was my first 
experience with the medical, like sustained experience with the medical system. And I had a lot of questions. I wanted to make the right choices. And, but I also wanted to understand a lot of the logic behind some of the things people are told, like you can't have any coffee or you can only have a little coffee or, you know, you can't have any alcohol or you can have a little alcohol, like whatever is that this stuff. So I actually ended up, and actually, honestly, for me, like the biggest thing was like prenatal testing, like the landscape is sort of different than it is now, but like that was like a big sort of an obsession. I I, like wanted to make the right choice there. And I felt like I didn't get a lot of answers. Meaning like the blood test of finding out what, what do you, the, so, so this question of, so now they do it with a blood test, but thinking about um, testing for chromosomal problems right. in the, in the infant. So now there's like a very good blood test. When I was pregnant for the first time, there was like a choice between something invasive, which was risky and something um, which wasn't that informative. And there was like a sort of arbitrary rule about who should get what. Um, and I huh. got just like really like into trying to understand this. And, and I basically found I was sort of like doing my job at, in the service of my pregnancy. Like I was like doing all the stuff that I did all day at my job, like we're getting research papers and making spreadsheets and like figuring out what the data said. And, and so, um, so then I, I did sort of come to think, okay, like there, there would be like a book, you know, maybe I could write this down for other people. Um, and I, I like to write, um, I like to write for audiences that are not academics, which is actually not super common among academics, but anyway, is something that I like. Uh, and so then I kind of wrote some pieces of it and, um, and, and then honestly, like I sent it, I think probably sometimes these pivots are just sort of unexpected. Like I, I wrote like an introduction, a chapter, and I was like, oh, this was kind of fun. I enjoy doing this. Like, and I sent it to, to this person who is now my agent, um, who was the agent of a, of a friend of mine. And I was like, hey, you know, I don't know if you like think anyone would buy this. And she was like, yes, great. We'll sell it next week. And I was like, okay, <laughs> you know, and no it was way. just like, I was like, all right, great. And, and then I was sort of like, oh, I'm, I'm like, and I, I'm like, I honestly, like I hadn't even really talked about it with my husband that much. And so I was just like, okay, <laughs> yeah. great. Like, that never goes over like, well. <laughs> she was like, all right, uh, good choices. Um, so, you know, it was a big, um, I mean, it was a big risk. It was a really big change um, in terms of like what my job was going to be like or how it was going to be perceived. And I'm not sure. I, th- I think it ended up being a much bigger deal than I thought that it would be beforehand. Like it was just, it was like, it's such an unusual thing to do to like write a popular book that is about sort of like I tell people sometimes the book is like a combination of memoir and meta analysis. Like it's sort of about my pregnancy. It's sort of about, you know, me, but it's also most of it's just about data and like, what does the evidence really say on these, on these kind of questions? But it's, it, it's just a really weird thing to do. And I think people, some people perceived it as a really weird, not only in a <laughs> super positive way. <laughs> it's my most recommended book to other people about this issue because i've been like so overwhelmed and i'm i was like doing uh research on like hey how do, how do you be a dad and what i'm trying to find out is like what the heck do i need to know so that i can make the right decisions to raise my child and so i love your book because if i was if i was going to write one this would be exactly what i would want to share with the world um i'm curious what type of people have you found read your books is it like a really wide spectrum or is it like like, you know, a certain demographic or what does that look like? So I think I, I mean, I think it's, it's a, it's a certain demographic, um, but not, it's not super narrow. So, so for a while I thought like, I'm only going to sell this book to like people who have a PhD in economics, but like that turned out not to be right. The audience is, is broader than that. I mean, I think I, I tend to appeal to people who are like the, like, like evidence who like, like want to make choices based on data. Um, so people who are like, you should just, you know, you should just do what feels right for you. Like, this is not really the book for the, for that group. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, I think, and I think that probably the demographic skews sort of like higher education, um, than the average population. But this, this could be super amateur of me, but I do want to challenge you a little bit on you saying that it's not for people who like just this feels well. Cause I feel like you do, you do such a good job. Uh, at doing what other people don't do a good job at and having caveats or just presenting the the platform for uh, opinion and like, Hey, this is just what the data said. I just, I just feel like you're welcoming and inviting to so many different things. I also think your honesty in, um, in the data and how you analyze that and present it and saying, Hey, 
Uh, there's a lot of studies that say that, or on the other hand, there's not a lot of studies, but what those studies do say is X. I think that's incredibly important. And I think just like in general, the, I, I wish there was more of the honesty and presenting of data uh, as you did it. So uh, that, that's why I'm so geeked to talk to you right now because I just feel like you executed that really well. Yeah, um, no, that's, that, is, that is great. That was the goal. And so I always wonder if I achieved it, but good. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I want to talk about the pivot for you in the sense that you mentioned you do kind of economics in the health realm. But these books that you've written, Expecting Better and Crib Sheet, are both about parenting, which, yes, obviously is, is a lot about uh, health. But it's, has it pigeonholed you to being like the, you're, hey, you're the parenting expert or like the parenting ec- ec- economist? Yeah. I mean, I think that, um, you know, I think I have tried to sort of keep my academic world like sort of separate from the books. Yeah. And I think that that, um, that was actually not so hard with the first book because, you know, I published this book and then like, I kind of kept writing papers and, and, um, and the first book, you know, has, has become more successful over time, but wasn't like actually that successful in the first, you know, so not that many people knew about it, I think. Um, so, so the second book, um, which is about parenting, I think it was objectively more successful from the get go. And I think now there's more of a like, okay, I'm like the, the economist who writes about parenting. Um, but I still do, I, I like it is still my academic work is, is still kind of pretty separate from this. So like the, the other thing that I'm doing this week is like preparing a bunch of talks about like methodological issues in like, you know, data analysis, like basically like statistics. Um, and I'm going to talk about those to economists. And so I'm still trying to like be like a regular like, economist um, some of the time, but I don't know. It's, it's, it is definitely influenced how I think people perceive my contributions to the world. Have you, have you embraced that or is a part of you that resents that? Cause I, well, so way different worlds, but I don't want, if somebody just says Andrew Reese is a football player, I like hate that. Like, I'm like, no, don't call me just a football player. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. No, I, <laughs> yes, no, I do. And I think it's, yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm tr- I try to embrace it, but I think it is, uh, the sort of at the, I don't know, at the, at the end of the day, I, I, uh, I feel like I do, I don't know, I feel like I can do a lot of these different things and I'm not, I'm not sure it's, uh, yeah, just being like the, like the parent economist is like a little tricky. <laughs> Although wildly important, and this is something that like has appalled me over Sean's, I guess, I, I don't do math very well, six months pregnant now or something <laughs> like that. And the amount of passion or should I say zeal that people have um, over how to do that, (laughs) how to be pregnant and then how to raise your kid. I mean, we put a lot of our life on social media. So we, we, um, I guess, warrant it to a certain extent, but the amount of unsolicited advice that we've gotten or criticism that we've gotten is just wild, you know? Yeah. No, people really feel like they, like you want to know what they think about your thing. Your yeah. friend, like they, they, they think you need to do that. You know, it's like, oh my God. It's like, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't need to know. That. I mean, people, this is a thing it's not just about. Like I got, and I had a letter the other day from somebody, like a letter, like somebody mailed me a letter. Like they took time to find my office address and mail me a letter, which was about how on a podcast they had listened to, I kept saying data is rather than data are. No. And they found it impossible to listen to the podcast <laughs> because of this error. And I was uh, just like, all right, thanks for taking the time. I, oh thanks my for your gosh. thoughts. <laughs> but I mean, to their credit, that is something that kind of, you know, I, I struggle with data is data are. It I, turns out both of them are fine. I think <laughs> okay. the, new, the new thing is they're both fine. <laughs> I got you. Good to know. Um, that's funny. So is there any other topic besides parenting that that is like this in as far as public opinion and how people express themselves. I just, I think it's so unique in that people have this vast attachment to it. And you talk about it in crib sheet, uh, people wanting to, obviously raising a child is like to a lot of people, the the pinnacle of life. But uh, you talk about this avoiding cognitive dissonance. And so like, if I raise my kid, um, if my kid sleeps on his stomach then I think that's that's the way everybody should raise their kid on their stomach because I'm trying to justify my decision. I just it's just such an interesting mix of 
everything that makes this such a unique topic, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No. And I think that, I think that is a big, that is a big piece for parenting is kind of, you want to have, you just so want your decisions to be right. That you kind of want them to be right for everybody because that's how you know that they're like super right. Um, And, you know, and I, I mean, I'm not sure where else, I think this comes up in some other like personal choices. Like people sometimes talk about their diets like this, you know, and people, as you were talk about food, like people who are into like, you know, particularly if you're into kind of like weird, like weird, like I don't, you know, I don't like, like weird kind of diets, diet, the keto diet, like the keto diet, yeah, right? Yeah. Paleo diet, you know, like, it, you know, it's like if people kind of get into like, cro- yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. like, you know, sort of things you're doing where it's like, it's like costly to do it. And like, you know, it's kind of like, you, you're like eating all these like meat sticks, you know, you don't want it, people to be like any diet, you know what I mean? Like any diet's fine. Like, I'm like, I'm eating these like weird, you know, you want that to be right. If you're eating yeah. meat sticks. Can you talk about in expecting better what some surprising uh, findings were for you personally? Yeah, I mean, I think the the one that like kind of really um, I found very surprising was this stuff about bed rest, um, which I still sort of comes up a lot for like a lot of pregnant people are put on bed rest, um, and it turns out that's like a terrible idea, um, mm-hmm. and it's, there's like nothing for which that's a good. Uh, for which that's something good. So that's a sort of like, that's not in the like lifestyle space, but it is, I think it, it's something that impacts a lot of people for no reason. Uh, right. And I had sort of assumed that like, okay, there, you know, maybe it's not everything, maybe it's not useful for everything, but that like there's a bunch of things where that's a good idea, but actually like, no, there's no things basically for which that's, for which that's a good idea. Very interesting. So were there any topics that uh, created the most, outlash or criticism of the book? Yeah, I mean, I think there's absolutely no question that the discussion of alcohol was the, like, focal point for a lot of the backlash. Um, and so, I mean, these, you know, so I can tell you what I say about that in the book, which is that I I sort of go through, like, a bunch of many, many, many studies, um, most of which are from Europe, which are, like, around the question of, like, is it okay to occasionally have a glass of wine while you're, while you're pregnant or drink of some sort and basically argue that, that in all of those studies where people are drinking occasionally, uh, there is no evidence of negative impacts on the kids in the data, which of course doesn't mean that everybody should drink during their pregnancy. I mean, people make different choices about this, but that, you know, they're, they're the kind of evidence that, that suggests that you should not drink a lot, which is very strong, is n- does not immediately follow into the sort of occasional drinking space. Um, not everybody was very happy with that discussion and this is we mentioned uh i i mentioned you're um you're inviting to so many different opinions and in crib sheet you you have a whole paragraph on preferences and you say preferences are important two families with the same food cost the same value of time the same options may make different choices because they have different preferences and um that's what I, i i just think the the backlash from something like that where you, it's not like you're telling people to drink alcohol. Right. Which is how people are like, you know, this is the book. They, this book tells people, it's like, no, I absolutely, that is not what, that is not what this is, this is about. It's about, you know, and I, you know, showing people what the evidence is. And I think that, that in that space, there was sort of some pushing saying like, well, I don't, people telling me like, we shouldn't show people the evidence on this because, you know, what, if we tell them it's okay to have one drink, then, you know, maybe like women will like just have five drinks um, and you know, it'd be better to tell them to have nothing. Um, although, you know, I think that's also a little complicated because if you tell people to have, have nothing and then they have one and they're like, well, as long as I had one, I might as well have five because it's all the same. Then that's also not good. Um, right. I also think there's a sense in which like, you know, I, pregnant women are still people. And, you know, I think most people, if you tell people you can have one, like, why, why are we assuming that, that these women are not going to be able to like, have this kind of self-control i'm not sure yeah it's kind of it's it's almost like uh the matrix red pill blue pill like oh don't tell them because they're not mature enough to deal with it to deal with this yeah i mean it's it's part of this sort of general like infantilization of pregnancy so Um, yeah yeah that's a a good way to put it this is i i just again i'm just hyping up your work you guys listening who haven't read cripsy or expecting better i would highly recommend it i found so much um encouragement in it because I, we've never had a kid 
there's so many things that you do on a daily basis where it's like, oh shoot, I just ate, um, I just ate a red fish or, or, a, or a white fish, or I had X amount of red meat this week. And you're like, you can get so caught up in, is that the right decision? Do we just screw up our kid? Honestly, even with the data, there's a lot of different ways to go about it. And yeah. there's a lot of ways to raise a healthy kid. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's in some ways that's even more true in the parenting. Like, I mean, that's true. Of course it's true in the pregnancy, but I think this, these kind of things come up all the time in parenting where like, you know, you'll find out once you have a kid, like there's many ways that you can feel like you're messing up. And every moment there's like another thing where you're like, Oh, if I don't like give them the, 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 the this kind of flashcards or like, what if all the toys, what if I don't have all the <laughs> yeah. wooden toys, you know, it's like, and then it's like, it's fine. Any kind of, you give them a box. That's a fine toy. You know, <laughs> it's just like a lot of good ways uh to do this and i think there's sort of some comfort in that in that message yeah Um, because you're still even if you have that message you're still going to be like obsessing about the toys for sure right getting the right toys today's episode is brought to you by zip recruiter if you want to find out more about zip recruiter you can visit ziprecruiter.com forward slash east The way it works is ZipRecruiter sends your job to over 100 of the web's leading job boards, but they don't stop there. With their powerful matching technology, ZipRecruiter scans thousands of resumes to find people with the right experience and invites them to apply to your job. As applications come in, ZipRecruiter analyzes each one and spotlights the top candidates so you never miss a great match. ZipRecruiter is so effective that four out of five of employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site within the first day. And right now, my listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com forward slash east. That's ZipRecruiter.com forward slash E-A-S-T. ZipRecruiter really is the smartest way to hire. Today's episode is brought to you by Away. Away gives you first class luggage at a coach price. And their approach is simple, to create special objects that are designed to be resilient, resourceful, and essential to the way you travel today. Away uses high-quality materials while offering a much lower price compared to other brands by cutting out the middleman and selling directly to you. You can even get free shipping on any Away order within the lower 48 states. You can choose from nine different colors and four different sizes. My personal favorite is the carry-on. And some of the features that I love about Away products are that all the suitcases are made with a premium German polycarbonate, which is unrivaled in its strength and impact resistance. And the interior features a patent-pending compression system, which is helpful for you overpacking Packers out there. There's a removable, washable laundry bag that keeps dirty clothes separate from the clean. And both sizes of the carry-on are able to charge all cell phones and anything else that's powered by a USB cord. There's a lifetime warranty, so if anything breaks, they will fix it or replace it for life. And a 100-day trial, so you can live with it, vibe with it, travel with it, Instagram it, and if you want to return it, you get a full refund. If you guys want $20 off your suitcase, go to awaytravel.com forward slash east and use promo code EAST during checkout. That's $20 off a suitcase at awaytravel.com forward slash east. Use promo code EAST during checkout. I got advice from uh, a teammate of mine, Tress Way. I was like, dude, how, like, how do you be a dad? He's like, hey, as long as they're alive and breathing, you're doing a good job. <laughs> but but it, was, it was at a point where I was stressed out because we were getting all these opinions and like they start getting to your head and you're like, Oh my gosh! Yeah, like you, you're responsible for um, for this person's life. Sean and I went through the 20 week ultrasound. This is a huge learning lesson for us. But uh, we did like the little 3D thing for the first time, and I'm sitting there um, looking at the spinal cord and the fingers and the face, and I'm like, God, this is this is amazing because all this happened. This whole thing was created, and I didn't really have like we didn't have control over it really like this you you didn't do anything yeah and then the OBGYN comes in after and she's like hey the results just look there they just look okay and so sean had you know x complication that could lead to this disorder and then this was underdeveloped which might be an indication for that and like sean and i just we just broke down crying we're like whoa like what this the whole thing can how do you do this um but it seems like beyond that issue it seems like uh depending on who you ask and again this is why i love your book everything is okay and nothing 
is okay. Mm -hmm. It's like, geez, like, well, oh, well, this study says, I mean, vaccines has been just... You know, I find this really hard to to talk about. So, you know, I um, don't... Like I, I say, and I talk in the book about, you know, you should vaccinate your kid. And I actually, you know, I think one of the the issues that we have in in talking across on this, um, in this space is is that like the the pro-vaccine guys, the kind of CDC government, whatever, are, are basically like, you know, you should vaccinate your kid. Trust us. We're experts. You know, we know what's best. And then the, the kind of other side is like, well, you know, why don't we look at the data? Like they almost see more evidence-based. Like we have these studies and they show da, 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 da. And even though like those studies are totally flawed, it ends up sort of seeming like here's this like guys with evidence. And then there's these people who are just like, oh, I'm an expert. You know, it's like, what? What, for what? What do you mean? He's <laughs> yeah. just like some old guy. Um, and so I really spent, like I spent, you know, a long time on that chapter, even though I already knew, I was kind of convinced of what the yeah. the evidence was going to be. I spent a long time really going through like the details of some of these, you know, what are there any complications for vaccines? What, you know, what are they? And kind of trying to to show that, look, yeah, there, there are a few things that can happen, but they're like very very minor. They have no long-term consequences. You know, like, yeah, your kid can get a fever, but like, that's okay. Like, it's not, you know, that's not, that's not dangerous. Um, and so then I thought I would like write this and then people who would be like, oh yeah, you're totally right. Um, which is definitely not what happened at all. Never. Um, and you know, I have had some conversations with some people who are on the other side of this and you know, I, I don't always find these conversations to be super evidence-based. I think people are kind of pulling on like, well, wh- here's one, you know, here is this one study. And you're like, well, there's a problem with this. And they're like, well, here is this other study or, you know, yeah. people. And it's like, well, what about, you know, I'm like, okay, well, we have the study of, you know, almost a million kids in Denmark who are, uh, you know, who were vaccinated and the vaccine risk, the risk of autism is lower in the vaccinated kids than the, the non-vaccinated kids. So like that, and that's like a million people, you know, that's like it's so many people. They're like, well, in Denmark, they give the first vaccines at two, at three months instead of two months. So we can't really use that data. It's like, right. it doesn't make any sense, but like, I mean, what is even like, what is even the response to that? So yeah. How do you, how do you go about um, constructing your studies? You know, cause there's, analysis or meta-analysis how do you do what you do so I try to I think there's like two stages one is you know I try to read um I try to read everything um and in some of these like in some cases there's more than others so when I study something like breastfeeding I mean, there's like thousands of papers about the links between breastfeeding and other and other things um and so I try to read all of them most of them in some cases I actually have like research assistants separately do literature reviews and so I make sure that like my technique is not mm. missing some important stuff and then I you know I try to use that to kind of figure out what I think is the, tr- what is the truth? Like what are the best studies show? Um, and then I, then I think that the other thing that's kind of different from the way I would do academic works, so if you were going to do an academic paper about this stuff, you just like sort of summarize everything. You'd be like, okay, there's a thousand studies and you know, here's what all thousand of them say or whatever. In a book, you can't write about every, can't write about all thousand studies. Um, and right. so I spend a lot of time sort of thinking about which of the studies are the best and also which of them sort of best illustrate some of the problems with the other ones. So I really want people to come out, you know, understanding not just what I think the conclusion is, but why I think the data support that um, and what are some of the problems in the papers that I think are, you know, are more flawed. And I think that that is the part that is the hardest, but also the most fun for me. Because to a certain extent, uh, I guess there is some trust that the audience has uh, and you and saying, oh, well, you know, she's deciding that this is good evidence. Yeah. And yeah. And I think you, you know, people, I feel like people should have that trust because this is my job. Um, and you <laughs> yeah. know, they pay me a bunch of money to like, whatever, do this. Um, but I think that, that I, I've tried to have it not just be like, trust me, you know, cause I think there are, when I wrote Expecting Better and I looked at, at the landscape, there actually were some other books, some of them written by people who were like, were doctors yeah. that came to many of the same conclusions, but mostly they were just like, you know, I'm, I, because I'm a doctor, I read papers and I'm, this is my conclusion. And so I'm trying to sort of take at least one more step and say, you know, here is, here's kind of why. And then by the way, in the back of the book, here's like, you know, 25 pages of single space references. And if you like really need to know more about this topic, like go there and mm-hmm. read the papers and then you can sort of see what they cite and it like, gives you a starting point. Very good. So, um, 
So we talked a, a little bit about the findings of expecting better. Can you talk about some of the surprising things in crib sheet that you found out doing that? So I think there aren't as many much more, I mean, you sort of alluded to this, but like much more of crib sheet is like sort of, yes, there are a lot of good parenting choices and like you need to figure out what works for for you. Um, and so I think there aren't as many things where it's like, aha, like people tell you this and here's this other thing that is that is the truth. Um, I think one that a lot of people find surprising, although it's like kind of in the weeds is this stuff about peanut allergies. So, um, so peanut allergy is like a huge thing now. A lot of people have them. Um, mm. It turns out that uh, exposing your kids to peanuts when they're very little, like at four months, is really good at preventing development of allergies. Um, and that's probably true for things other than peanuts, but it's certainly true for, for peanuts. Um, and so there's kind of a big shift from what you know you used to be told, like don't introduce peanuts until kids are like one or two. And now people are like, give them peanuts right away. Like as yeah. soon as they're, you know, born, the slathering on them. Um, and so that's, I think that that was something that a lot of people find surprising. And it's kind of one of the few things in the book where it's like, this is, listen, this is something you should definitely do um, mm-hmm. because it's not hard to do. And it's not, there's no like reason that you would not do it except that you didn't know about it. Yeah. Um, was there any um, controversy or pushback from crib sheet? I think the one place I got a little bit, although way less than expecting better, um, is about breastfeeding. So, you know, I think that the the kind of rhetoric, you're probably already getting this, um, but like the rhetoric around breastfeeding is sort of like breast milk is liquid gold. It's, you know, this is the best way to give your kid the right. best start. Da, da, da. Um, and I, you know, and I think that what I kind of say in crib sheet is like, yeah, like breastfeeding is great. Um, and there is a sense in which like it is, it is best in the sense that there are some benefits to, uh, to your kid, particularly around kind of early health, but that a lot of these more grandiose claims, like it's going to make your kid smarter or thinner or healthy when they're older, like those things are not supported in the, in the data. Um, and you know, some people didn't like that. A few people. Yeah. Is it true that from a mother's perspective, just the caloric burn is like compelling? No. I mean, it does burn awesome. calories. It burns calories. I don't know. It burns calories. It's just that like the claim that it helps you lose weight. Like when you look at like the differences in weight loss between men who breastfeed and women who don't, it's like, you know, a, like a difference of like a half a pound or a pound. No. Yeah, because you eat you more. You just rocked my world. Because you eat more. You nurse, you lose calories, but you, you eat more because you're hungry. Oh uh, yeah, I guess that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> that was, I hadn't heard you talk about that. I was like, I have to ask about the caloric there you go. burn. Like, God. Yeah. Yeah. Really? In fact, a lot of women, I mean, in an anecdotal sense, a lot of women say they have a very hard time losing the last of the baby weight until they stop nursing because your huh. body's like holding on to some, you know, fat so they can, can make the milk. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I guess, I guess as an athlete, there's, you know, been talk, people have asked me, are you going to drink <laughs> this, Sean's breast milk? And I thought they were joking at first. I thought they were joking at first, but it, apparently you can buy it on the black market, breast milk in general. And so they're like, if your wife, hey. And that's going to help your performance? Because apparently it's so nutrient dense. Have you, (laughs) are we going to cut this part of the, (laughs) should I, (laughs) I'm not kidding. No, that's it. That's amazing. I have a drink. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, It's very sweet. It's very sweet. I, I haven't tried it, so yeah. Well, you know, I, guess now I don't have a reason to. But I was, no, I mean, you, kind of you, gotta, you, gotta, you gotta try it to see what it is. <laughs> okay. Wow. Huh. Good to know. Um, yeah. This is somewhat related to the peanut allergy, but it's slightly different. Can you tell me about gluten allergies and celiac and the whole thing? Is there any way? Is that strictly genetic? Is it? So do I don't think we know that. I mean, celiac disease is, so first of all, there's like many different versions of this. So, so celiac, like true kind of celiac disease, which is actually not that common, does have a genetic com- component. Um, wheat is a common allergy. So wheat allergy and celiac are not the same thing. Um, wheat is a common allergy and same kind of principle as peanuts that early exposure is, uh, to, seems like it is I think th- this is more speculative, but I think generally we think that early exposure to wheat lowers the risk of developing a wheat allergy, which again is sort of different from a gluten, a gluten sensitivity, which is yeah. also itself different from celiac. Okay. Great. Are you a celiac? Yeah. I, I'm not. No. Uh, Sean will fleece me for putting this out there, but she says she's uh, gluten sensitive. And I'm like, 
I think, I think unless you're celiac, we should be paying a premium for all this, you know, uh, gluten-free, gluten-free food. Gluten -free food. But mm. I have my, a lot bias. of people do think they have a, a gluten sensitivity. What about, this is my last just tangent question, but what about um, lactose intolerance, dairy products? So a lot of people develop, so lactose intolerance obviously has a genetic, genetic component because there are like po whole populations with very high rates of lactose intolerance. And most adults, um, if you stop drinking milk, if you stopped consuming lactose, you would develop some intolerance. Like we're not really designed to, con I mean, it's like, you know, like mammals, most mammals do not continue to drink milk as they, as they grow. Right. Gotcha. Um, so most people are, you know, at risk for a lactose, um, a lactose intolerance, but, you know, given that you're, given your demographic picture, your kid probably won't be lactose intolerant, but again, same thing about milk, like early exposure to milk, um, like in the form of cheese can make kids more tolerant. Hmm. Very not all kids like milk. My kids don't like my, my, one of my kids likes milk. The other one doesn't. So interesting. Huh. Um, because it's important and I want people to get another snapshot of, of your work. We talked about the breast milk. You separate um, what the data does support and the benefits of it by caveating it with the demographics of the people who typically yeah. breastfeed. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So this is probably the biggest challenge to this, to this area of research is that basically the, the women who breastfeed, particularly in the U.S., particularly now, are very different uh, than women who do not. So breastfeeding is much more common among high educated, rich, white, uh, you know, kind of like upper middle class women in their 30s than among other groups. And those characteristics, particularly things like education are, and income, are associated in the data with better outcomes like high, like better test scores. Um, and that's for a lot of different reasons. We can talk about that on a different show. Um, but, that's, uh, but that means it's very hard to know, is it the breastfeeding or is it this other stuff? And so I think the best studies of this are ones that are able to really kind of carefully adjust for differences across, uh, across women um, or uh, to, to actually like, compare siblings. So I think many of the best studies of this look at like two siblings, one of whom is breastfed and one of whom is not, and look at things like, do they have different test scores later? And that way you're kind of holding constant like who the mom is, and that helps with a lot of those problems. Super interesting. Yeah. Um, okay, so how old is your oldest? My oldest is eight and my younger one is four. So the book was written... Years. Well, the first book was written when my daughter was like, was a, a baby. My older one is a baby. The second book is kind of, was kind of written when my son was like kind of just aging out of it when he was like two. So. Have you learned any new insights since being through the whole cycle now? Uh, you know, um, I learned, one of the things I've learned is that older kids are, are harder. Um, huh. So, you know, in the moment of having a baby, you're just like, nothing could be harder than this because you're so tired. Right. And it is true that it is very hard to have a baby and you will be very tired. Um, but, you know, as your kids get bigger, like the kinds of problems that they have and the, and the, just the, the issues like seem so much more, they just seem harder and partly because your kid like has their own opinions and kind of how do I like raise a competent adult, not, you know, is a much different question than like, you know, kind of should I swaddle or not, which is like important and something you should, you know, dis decide about, but is also like a very small, minute thing. Not like, you know, how can I get my kid to like be socially integrated? So th that's another thing that I was uh, alerted of going through this is like, at first, like at first you don't want kids like when you're, you know, in high school, but then you go through a phase of like, Hey, we're trying to get pregnant. And so there's this hope of like, Hey, we might be pregnant. hope it sticks. You know, the, that whole thing. Yes. Sean and I experienced a miscarriage. So then this is our second go around. You're just like, ah, oh, is this going to stick around? And then not that we're out of that, but it's like developmentally wise, like, are they going to have all the things that they need physically? You know what I'm saying? Like, do yeah. they have 20 toes or 28 or 10 toes, right? Is that how many toes? Yeah, 10 toes. 10 is the, 10 is the right. right number. Yeah, that's what we're going like, for. I guess, I guess looking when I'm in this phase now, I'm like looking at you mentioning the the more complex problems of, of differences in kids. I'm like, God, I just, I just hope that my kid gets to that point. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. No, no, it is. I mean, and I think it's like, it's, it, yeah, every, every kind of moment with your kid sort of feels like, like I, 
like you're sort of looking at these later things and it's like, well, like that'll be great when we're, when we're doing that. And I, like in some ways it gets, it just gets like easier and better and more fun, but it's also mm-hmm. like, you know, it's sort of stressful in different, in different ways. Yeah. I'm, I'm realizing the stress is, is part of the job title now. Yep. Um, exactly. What do you think is the best way to have conversations around this sensitive subject of parenting? Like, is there any advice that you have of that? I think the only, I mean, the only advice I would have is sort of from my personal, like my personal approach to this. So like, I am like naturally a tremendously bossy person. Um, And now I'm like a bossy person who has written these books on pregnancy. Right. So I'm like, so I'm, I'm, my instincts when people are like, you know, well, like people ask me questions, my instincts are to be like, you know, well, here's what you do. Let me give you like the checklist for, you know, and I actually found myself, particularly in the wake of the book, really fighting that and just being like, well, you know, I can tell you what worked, you know, I can tell you what I did, but it's not obviously the right thing for you. And I think if we could have a little bit more of that tone, some of, you know, it's, it's sometimes easy to, to morph from like advice into like sort of bossy judgment um, or to have people hear it that way, even if that is not the way you mean it. Hmm. Um, And that's different than just like, you shouldn't post on people's Instagram about how like they're being a shitty parent. Like that's not, um, you know, you shouldn't do that. Um, It's 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 not effective. effective. (laughs) They're not listening to you. Um, But even if it's sort of well, well well-meaning, there's a, there's a kind of tone that sometimes I think comes across wrong that we could be a little more careful about. Very interesting. Well said. And good self-awareness. Um, so I thought this whole topic would be applicable to the show because I, I feel like for a lot of people, having kids is a pivotal moment, obviously in life, but also oftentimes with kids. Uh, has that, I was watching this National Geographic, it's called Geniuses Series. I don't know if you've seen that, but yeah. uh, it's good. And I think in both uh, the Picasso and Einstein, there's this mention of the tension of you can't have a successful career and ha- be committed to your family. Do you think that's still relevant in this day and age? Have you personally struggled with that? Um, I th- I don't think that I I don't think that that's true. I think you can have a successful career and have a family. I think that it is. Um, you know, I think that there are challenges that come with trying to do two things well, and it is frequent. I frequently feel I'm doing both things poorly, um, <laughs> basically. And and you know, I but I. I think some of it is, is like sort of rec- some of what I try to do is recognize that like, this is like a moment, you know, like my kids are pretty little mm. and they need like a lot, they need a lot. Um, and sort of thinking about your successful career as kind of like being your whole, there, like there's many years of, of yeah. time for your job, which are maybe some of which will overlap and some of which will, will not. And so, so I think part of what's hard is that often the times when your career is like, this is this is both an age when your your kid you're likely to be having little kids at an age in which many people are kind of making a lot of professional investments and it's um it's hard to balance and i think maybe just recognizing that like most of the time you're going to feel like you're not doing a good job balancing but like everyone else also thinks that um that can be kind of helpful okay not that they think you're doing a bad job but that they think they're doing a bad <laughs> <Yeah>. job <laughs> um okay three more questions and then yeah. i'll let you off so Aside from the parenting work that you've done and that research, what other projects uh, are you excited about or have you been excited about in the past? So I'm pretty excited about the thing I'm doing now, um, which is about um, trying to understand why so much of the research that we do around like these public health, um, kind of like people's health behaviors, why so much it is so, is so flawed. Um, so trying to think about like, you know, when you, when you tell people to take vitamins, the kinds of people who take vitamins are different from the ones who don't like the people who listen to that advice tend to be, you know, high education, rich people. Um, and that means that like, once you tell people to take vitamins, then your, your data is going to make it look like vitamins are good for you because the people who are taking the vitamins are kind of doing other good things and that that makes it really hard to learn about this. So that's like something I'm doing now that I've wanted to do for a long time that I'm excited about. So it's like inception uh, and data analysis. It's like, well, how exactly. many levels? How many yeah, levels? we're like, we're like in the... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's crazy. Um, okay, so I always ask this and I leave it open-ended intentionally, but what are your goals now? Um, oh, I mean, 
I feel like I am at, and it's a good time to talk to you, I guess. Um, I mean, I feel like I am at a little bit of a, of a pivot um, in terms of what I do next. You know, this book, the, the second book was pretty successful. And I think now I could write another book. Um, and, but I don't, I can't decide if I want to or not. Um, and I, you know, do, I'm doing a lot of my regular like research at my job, but I'm also doing a lot of like administrative administration stuff in my university. And I'm sort of trying to figure out like which of these paths I want to take. I'm almost 40. And so I don't know, like, I feel like maybe I should pick a, pick a lane. Um, so you, I, I don't know. How are you going to go about making that decision? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I haven't, uh, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I feel like this is the fir- kind of one of the first times that I've made a really intent, like tried to think really intentionally about, about that kind of choice. Um, but I'm not sure I have like a great framework for, for how to do it. Yeah. That's um, so I started this show because I, play football professionally and it's like i i like it but i also have so many other things that i'm excited about and some way like football is easier in some senses and there's security there but then also like there's so many positives to the the other stuff and it's like what is the framework for making huge life decisions yeah there's no like manual for that (laughs) exactly and um i feel like you kind of just i feel like you are either in decision making um phase of life or like dealing with those decisions and the consequences of those decisions. And you kind of want to stay away from like just uh, saturating yourself and marinating in those consequences and like try to keep making decisions and like being okay with that. Does that make sense? I don't know. Yeah, no idea. Uh, so that's, that's right. kind of what I've gleaned. So, um, last question, three takeaways that you've learned personally over your life or in your research that, could apply to the audience as a whole? Um, So, you know, I think when I, when I wrote the first book, a lot of like not good stuff happened career wise as a, Mm -hmm. as a result. Um, And I, but then it all like turned out really great. Um, Mm -hmm. And I, which was good. And I sort of wish that I had, um, had had a little more perspective at the time. Um, and so to sort of like look, at, you know, look two years down the road and realize things were going to be, um, going to be okay. Um, then I'm sure that's really a piece of, of wisdom. Um, but okay. Um, I think, I think uh, you know, I think the other, the other thing I will say about, about parenting um, is I think we should, I, I try very hard to, um, be really open about the way that I parent and about my like desire to be a good parent um, in other settings, you know, particularly at my at my job. Um, and I think being willing to say, you know, I I am going to make a different professional choice because uh, I care about being with my kids at this stage. I think that's something that I um, that I wish other wish people would feel like they could they could do. Mm. Um, and I think the other thing, which is also about my kids, because I think about them a lot, uh, is um, is that you you can't always like make your kids the thing that you want them to be, mm. um, which I find a hard lesson to learn. Wow. Thank you for taking the time to be on the show, Emily. Thank you for all the work that you've done and the books that you've written. Uh, they have left a positive impact on my life and I know many others. So if you guys haven't checked out Emily's work, Expecting Better and Crib Sheet, uh, you can find them on Amazon. Mostly is where I sell things on Amazon. Right. <laughs> Amazon. Check, check her out. <laughs> But uh, thank you. It's it's great meeting you and great chat. Thanks, Andrew. It was great to talk to you. If you haven't yet, please make sure that you subscribe to the podcast and leave a review if you feel called to. Uh, It really helps the show out. And um, I love having a new audience. I love hearing what you guys think. And I love having you come back every single week.